Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the solar system that we're putting in. I'm not sure how all this is going to show up on the camera. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. I'm going to go over uh, a little bit at a time here. So, we're in Evansville, Indiana, and our utility rate, we, we built this house last year, and um, we're total electric. We're about a quarter of a mile off the road, and the utility installation cost for electric service was actually $22,000 is what they wanted. Um, so anyway, with projected consumption, we were able to get the credit down, or the credit to the point where we, we uh, only had to pay about uh, eleven or twelve thousand dollars out of pocket, which is still insane. Um, and on top of that, we get the new and improved fourteen point five cent per kilowatt hour uh, electric rate. Um, they used to our utility company Vectron used to have a total electric rate that you, if you were on electric only service, you didn't have natural gas or anything else, you got a discounted rate of eight or nine cents per kilowatt hour, I believe it was. Uh, they're getting rid of that, um, so they can essentially make uh, charge a higher rate. Uh, so uh, by the time we built our house, the only rate option we had was 14.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So as I mentioned, we have a total electric home. Our consumption is currently uh, an average of about 1,200 kilowatt hours per month. We use a system called uh, Effergy, um, which is basically a uh, it's a system that uh, clamps on to the uh, lines going into your main breaker box. It allows you to track uh, online and on a mobile app. It's pretty cool. Uh, your your real-time consumption and then your monthly consumption. So in addition to our utility bill, we track that and I'm able to see what our what our current consumption is at any given time. So I've been able to do a pretty good job of staying on top of our power usage and identifying loads that um, you know are costing us a lot of money, trying to, to minimize those. Additionally, I bought a kilowatt hour, a kilowatt meter, uh, which has been a great little tool uh, for those of you who are familiar with those. They um, plug into a circuit, into the wall, obviously, and then you plug the load into that, and it tells you what your consumption is um, you know, at, at that time. One nice thing, if you get something like that, don't get uh, an off-brand. A lot of those are just volt amp meters, um, which is just volt times amps uh, to try to give you a wattage. The problem with that is in alternating current, wattage is not volts times amps, it's volts times amps times power factor. And power factor varies depending on the kind of load you're running. So if you have a uh, if you have a resistive load or a, um, a load like a, an incandescent light or a heating element, then it's fairly accurate because your power factor is usually around one. However, if you have an inductive load or a capacitive load like electronics or a motor, uh, the power factor is generally quite a bit lower, and so your wattage is going to be totally off uh, if you use a volt amp meter as opposed to a a meter that takes into consideration power factor like the kilowatt meter does. So I recommend the kilowatt meter um, or, or another meter that takes, um, takes power factor into consideration for the calculation. So um, as I mentioned we use about 1200 kilowatt hours a month. We've reduced that now by at least 100. 102 is what I calculated after using the kilowatt meter to identify loads and reduce them. So I'm going to discuss some of these loads here. Um, our laser printer, surprisingly, um, color laser printer on standby mode, you would think it would be using a watt or two to sit there waiting for a network connection, you know, wait, waiting for a, a print signal. Uh, no, it was drawing 30 watts just to sit there, um, which is crazy. So that totaled 22 uh, kilowatt hours per month. Um, another load, so we're, we're turning that off unless we need it, unless we're going to print, so it's pretty easy. It's got a, a power switch on the side, so we're just going to turn it off until we need to print, and then we'll just manually turn it on and then turn it off and we're done. Um, another item that we found, these, are some, these little, these smaller loads all add up. Um, I use a product called the Belkin. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially a power strip that has a um, monitor or a, a control port on, on it. So basically, you plug a device into the control port, and when it starts drawing significant power, then it'll kick on all the other circuits on the circuit on the uh, the power strip. So it's really cool because what you can do that it works great in a lot of audio video situations. For example, if you plug your TV into the main port and you plug all your auxiliary appliances, um, you've got your you know receiver, your speakers, your sub. If you've got that, you've got a you know a Wii or uh, you know uh, Xbox or whatever. So you plug those into those uh, slave ports, and those all are shut off. If, if the TV's off, because you're not going to be doing those at the same time, generally. 
Uh, so it's great because when you turn on the TV, it'll kick on all the power to all the other devices. You don't have that standby load sitting there drawing 24/7. Um, you know, unless you manually turn all of them off, and even if you turn them off, um, you know, keep in mind a lot of those are drawing standby power, uh, especially uh, devices that are waiting on an infrared signal from a remote control or something like that. Uh, when I checked our TV out, uh, I was really impressed. It's a Sanyo, I believe, uh, LCD, 55 inch. Uh, but anyway, it actually didn't even register. Uh, I think it was zero, or it might have been half a watt. It's really, really low uh, for standby. I think it was zero. That's what it registered. Obviously, it's not zero, but that's what it registered as. Um, so that's very efficient, and uh, you know, you really don't have to worry about that if it's that efficient, waiting on a standby signal from infrared or remote control. Um, but a lot of devices, like I mentioned, the laser printer are considerably more than that. So going back down the list here, um, speakers. My wife and I have computers. I'm in our computer room, and uh, just our little speakers uh, for our computers. And I've just got a two-speaker system and a sub, and she has a two-speaker system. And those combined were drawing um, 7.2 kilowatt hours a month just to sit there on standby. So I've wired that into that, that uh, power strip I'm talking about so that when we actually move the mice on either of our monitor, move them, you know, our computer's going to sleep mode, we move the mouse, wakes up the computer, monitor kicks on. When the monitor kicks on, that also kicks on uh, the speakers and any other auxiliary devices around the computers. And that saved quite a bit. So, I mean, you know, not a ton, but it all adds up. So uh, 7.2 there, we saved 5.4 kilowatt hours a month uh, by replacing a security light um, that we were not using in dust to dawn mode, it's just motion activated. But I figured based on about an hour a day uh, that that thing's used when the dogs are out and triggering it or whatever, um, you know, that basically switched from, from going from a, a dual halogen system to a, an LED system. The light is, of course, comparable, uh, but that's saving us about 5.4 kilowatt hours a month. And then here's a really biggie, um, the receivers. So I mentioned um, the, the power strip that has the, the controllability. Well, our receivers, uh, we have a, a home theater and we have our living room uh, system. Our living room system has a 5.1 surround uh, and our, our theater has a 7.1. Um, both of those receivers were just sitting there essentially, you know, uh, I don't want to say in standby, but they were sitting there waiting uh, for us to use them. And when they're sitting there, I realized that totaled uh, quite a bit. Uh, so we were actually able to save 65 kilowatt hours a month by keeping those receivers off um, until we needed them. And, uh, and here's a shocker. It's a small, relatively small amount, but 1.37 kilowatt hours a month to run the coffee maker, maker clock. The little LCD clock on the front of the coffee maker uh, was uh, 1.37 kilowatt hours a month. So that uh, is a lot more than I expected. So you'll be surprised, I think, with some things if you take a kilowatt meter and run it around your house and look at the, the load, uh, the draw that your appliances are taking. Um, so anyway, we were able to, to cut this 1200 a month down to at least 1100 if not further. Um, another thing we're doing is we're adding a, a heat pump water heater, and I'll go ahead and talk about that. So our current water heater system is a, an on-demand electric water heater. It's about, uh, I believe, 28,000 watts or 27,000 watts. Um, that's substantial. Now, it doesn't actually draw that much. Um, it's, uh, it's three 40 amp circuits, two 40 circuits, I believe, that's run down to it. But essentially, when you turn on hot water, you know, it fires, a, it, it senses the flow and it checks the temperature and it kicks on the heating elements that it has in order to get the temperature up to where you have it set. And we only have it set at 125 or something fairly reasonable, um, or 120. But, um, you know, when it's on, that draws a lot. Now, when it's off, it doesn't draw anything. So it is more efficient than a traditional electric hot water heater that's sitting there warming up water that's in the tank just for the sake of warming it up and having it ready. Um, so I do recommend an on-demand water heater over that. But now you have uh, a new option, which is the heat pump water heaters. Those are great. We switched to a heat pump to heat our house instead of the, the all-electric furnace, uh, which is, was crazy cost-wise, and so when we, when we switched to a heat pump, we actually cut our total electric bill in the winter roughly in half. Um, so that's a huge, huge thing to do. Um, you know, it's nice because with a heat pump, what you're actually doing is you're, in the winter, you're sucking the, the warmth out of the outside air. You wouldn't think there'd be warmth when it was 20, when it's 20, 30 degrees outside, but there is warmth in the air, and it's able to basically suck that out and then send it in, uh, you know, through the system. It's a, the opposite of your air conditioner. It runs the opposite way 
um, and then blows warm air out you know, on the inside <coughs> of your home and heats it. Now the heat coming out of your vents is you know 80, 90 degrees instead of you know 120 or whatever uh, you know if you have a, uh, a dedicated gas or electric furnace like that. But uh, you know it's, it runs a little longer, but it's so much more efficient. The power consumption we were using off the top of my head, um, our heat pump to heat our hat home is somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four thousand watts when it's running, which is really good. Um, the the electric furnace when we were running it was in the on the order of thirty thousand, so <laughs> considerably more uh, more power there. Um, so uh, we've been really happy with that that heat pump. Now to the heat pump water heater. The cool thing about that is they've taken that technology and now you can get water heaters at Lowe's or Home Depot or what have you. And it's the most efficient way to heat your water from an electric standpoint uh, that you can have because it uses that same technology and it pulls the heat out of the air around the water heater and uses that to heat your, your water in the water heater. So what we're doing is we're adding, and again I'll get into the solar system in a minute, another benefit of the, that, that uh, heat pump water heater is that it's only going to draw five or 600 watts, if that, when it's running. So I can actually run it off grid. In the event that the grid goes down with the solar system and, and the battery bank and everything, I'll have the capability to you know have hot water and uh, heat the house, cool the house, all off grid if necessary. If the utility goes down, I won't really care. So that's a big benefit there. But uh, efficiency, efficiency wise, a heat pump water heater is a great thing. Uh, and we're actually going to keep the um, on demand water heater in the loop. And uh, that's uh, my wife wants that because basically, uh, well, she takes longer showers than she probably should, but essentially, um, you know, it's a 50 gallon heat pump water heater, so like any water heater, you can run out of hot water. Uh, the nice thing about the way this works is our on-demand water heater, the, the water out of the, the heat pump water heater is going to flow through the on-demand water heater. The on-demand water heater is just going to basically sit there and monitor it and say, and we, it's, you know, it's going to react based on the temperature we have it set to. So we're going to have the, the uh, heat pump water heater set a little bit hotter than the uh, threshold for the uh, on-demand water heater. So it's going to watch the water flowing through it and it's not going to kick any of those heating elements on unless the water's cold. And the only time the water's going to be cold is if you run out of the 50 gallons that's in there. So once we run out of hot water in the water heater, the on-demand water heater, provided we're on the grid, is going to kick on and say, hey, I've got it, and it's going to start heating that water going on through. So we still have infinite hot water as long as we have uh, the power to run it. So <clears throat> that's kind of the best of both worlds and a really cool way to do it, I think. Uh, so that is going to reduce our consumption even further. So this 1,200 kilowatt hours that we've reduced to roughly 1,100 kilowatt hours, it's hopefully going to reduce to around 900 kilowatt hours or so per month. Moving into the solar system and the way this works, the utility lines come in, in our case it's 7,200 volts off the road, uh, off of the primary and it goes to a transformer that we have back near, near our home here, which obviously steps that down to 240 volts AC. That goes to the meter on the side of the house, which then, uh, once this system is in place, one of the things I'm going to add is a, a surge protector. These surge protectors are from uh, Midnight Power, and they're, they're pretty good from, from the reviews that I've read. Essentially what that does is it protects the home and the system, everything from a surge that comes in from the grid. Now that can be that can be anything. That can be lightning that strikes down the road. That can be, uh, you know, even an EMP where uh, there's inductive current in the system. Uh, anything that, that's going to hit our home, uh, the goal is that that's going to shunt that to ground. Anything over a certain, certain voltage level, in this case it starts doing it over 300 volts. So if it spikes beyond that, it's going to start shunting that to the ground and save our house and hopefully the equipment from a surge that comes from that direction. Um, so then it's going to go to the main panel, which is currently in the home now. And that's just a typical 200 amp, uh, 120, 240 uh, AC uh, electric panel. And then that is going to continue even after the solar install to run what I call the non-critical loads. So that is our uh, furnace heat strips. I mentioned we had a, an electric furnace. We still do, uh, but we use the heat pump for the primary heating. For those of you familiar with heat pumps, you usually have a backup heat source, uh, either electric or gas, and that's designed to be used in the event that um, the heat pump can't keep up. If it gets, say, sub-zero, really, really, really cold, and there's just not enough warmth in the air, then it's going to kick on those backup heating elements to, to keep the uh, house warm. So those are the heat strips that we're going to uh, power, um, you know, off of that panel there. 
And also, as I mentioned, the on-demand or tankless water heater, that's also going to remain here because these are two things that we cannot run off-grid. They're just way too, you know, they take way too much power and uh, the system that we're putting in just simply can't handle it. So then we go to what is called the mini-grid. So basically this is the grid behind, um, you know, this is what comes in from the utility, uh, utility power side of it. This is everything else that I'm adding. So we're adding... Um, by code, you have to, well, at least with, with our uh, utility company, you have to, when you're, when you're putting in a solar system that's generating power back into the grid, um, you have to uh, do a net meter application or what they call an interconnection agreement. So you submit a, an application with the power company. In our case, it's regulated by the, the state of Indiana uh, Utility Regulatory Commission. And, um, and the process is. But it's pretty straightforward. In our case, it's under 10 kilowatts, so it's a, it's a fairly simple process. You submit an application, who you are, what you're doing. Well, part of what they require is a manual disconnect on the outside of the house that will disconnect the generation system uh, so that power can't go back um, onto the grid in the event that, um, you know, say the grid's down and they're, they're working on it. Obviously, you don't want power going back, you know, to, to hurt, hurt alignment that's on the poles. So there's a physical disconnect switch that they require that if they want to walk up to the side of the house and disconnect it, then they can't. However, that's really unnecessary because all the modern systems are UL compliant. They all shut off. You know, they basically they shut off the grid side of it. As soon as they detect the grid is down, they're not going to send voltage back that direction. They can't the way they're the way they're uh, set up. But I guess just as an added safety measure or way to cost you money uh, to discourage you from doing something like this, they require that switch. So we're putting that in. So that thing goes into this load box, and I'll talk a little bit about. This system is based, our system is based on what's called a, uh, an Outback Radian GS8048 uh, inverter, which is an 8 kilowatt inverter, uh, and it can spike all the way up to like, I believe it's 16 kilowatts for a very short time period to handle, um, to handle starting loads. So it's a really beefy system uh, for a, uh, an off-grid system like that. It's pretty cool. Um, so that, that has a Mate 3 control unit, and that's to uh, control everything. Basically, it's an electronic interface. gives you all the statistics and, and data on your system and, and everything that it's interconnected with. That's obviously the heart of the system is this Outback Radium, and that's the control unit for it. Um, this load box comes with, well, it's an, it's an add-on. So they call it a GSLC, but it's essentially a load box that attaches to the Outback Radium. That's going to then, uh, also coming in a low box, I'll talk about some of the DC stuff here. So we've got an, an Astro Energy solar array that we're setting up with 30 uh, 255 watt solar panels for a total of 7.65 kilowatts. Um, and that's DC going into another surge protector to protect the inverter and the system from any, any voltage spikes that come from the panel system. So if we have a, a lightning strike nearby that energizes those, that will likewise protect this, uh, this whole system from that side. Then also on the DC side, we have two Outback 80 amp charge controllers. These charge controllers will interconnect with, um, with a 48 volt DC uh, battery bank that I'm setting up with um, eight uh, AGM Rolls Charette uh, 400 amp hour uh, six volt batteries. So wired in series, that gets me a 48 volt battery bank of 19.2 kilowatt hours, which you can, uh, if necessary, take down to uh, you can, you can utilize 80% of that without damaging the batteries. So that gives us roughly 15 kilowatt hours battery capacity that, that's usable. Um, so that's, you know, in the event that obviously we're disconnected from the grid, uh, the house will run on battery. The solar system will continue to charge those batteries when we have solar power. Uh, you know, if we're disconnected from the grid, then obviously that's the only thing the solar is going to be used for as well as any loads in the house um, that are tied to it, but it's not going to go back into the grid when the grid's down, obviously. When the grid is up, the solar system is going to, number one, charge the batteries. That's its first priority. The inverter wants to make sure that battery bank stays flow charged and maintained. Provided it's full and provided the, the load in the home is being met, then it actually sends it back uh, via, you know, the inverter AC back on the grid and spins our meter backwards. So, you know, that's a, the grid is a great battery because it stores it without any losses. Like batteries generally have, you know, a certain percentage of loss that when you're using the grid as a battery, you don't. So uh, a grid tied system is very efficient. Um, you know, and that's obviously under normal circumstances uh, the big benefit financially. We also wanted the additional capability to be able to run off grid. So. Um, that's that's the point of the battery pack. You can you can buy a grid tie only system. You know, there's all kinds of manufacturers out there that do these 
Um, <coughs> and that's all it does, is it'll feed the power back into the grid, um, you know, or it'll obviously supply the power to your home when it's available, when you need it, and then, you know, any excess goes back into the grid, and then you pull that back at night when the solar system's not generating. Um, the only downside to that is there's no battery system, there's no backup, so, you know, if, if the grid goes down, you go down. So even though you got solar panels on your house, if you have a grid tie only system, um, that's it. You, you know, some of them have an additional plug where you can get power directly uh, when the sun is shining, but that's it. Pretty much uh, you're dead in the water when the grid is dead in the water. This is what's called a grid interactive system, so it does have backup capabilities, which is why we decided to go with it. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, two additional load panels in this diagram uh, beyond the main panel. So in my case, I want to add two additional load panels. Uh, two, they're both 100 amp panels. Um, and the only reason they're 100 amp is because I want to be able to run them off the grid uh, entirely if I want to. If I want to bypass all of this, I can. Um, there's a transfer switch within these panels. You can either use an external transfer switch, or in my case, it's a transfer switch that's um, it's called a, a generator uh, interlock kit, I believe. That basically takes two 100 amp breakers in the panel. It takes the main breaker and then a sub-breaker, and you, you can flip back and forth, and you, one's wired into a what they call the generator circuit and one's wired into the grid circuit. And so, um, you know, they can't be connected at the same time, obviously, and that's what that switch controls to make sure that they're one or the other, not both. Because both would be bad. Um, again, you don't want uh, juice going back into the grid from a generator that's not controlled properly, that's not, um, you know, in a UL-based system that's designed to disconnect uh, when the grid is, um, you know, down. So, um, I'm doing this because I want to be able to, like I said, bypass the system, but in general, under normal circumstances, when the system is working, the grid is, is up, um, I want to have this uh, critical sub-panel going through the inverter uh, being fed by that system at all times. So that's going to get the, the power from the solar system uh, and then excess will go back, back into the grid. So basically that's the critical loads, which in my case I'm wiring up pretty much the house. Um, into the critical load circuit as much, you know, the, the lower utilization uh, circuits. Now, uh, these big ones over here obviously are too big uh, to run through that. This is only 8 kilowatt. Um, and then I wanted to add a second panel for uh, what I'm calling the switchable sub-panel, and those are the quote-unquote switchable loads, which by switchable what I mean, what I mean by that is under normal circumstances I want to have that going off the main panel connected to the grid and not going through the inverter system, which is only 8,000 watts. That includes the heat pump, um, the range, the oven, stove, um, and the heat pump water heater. You know, I've got heat pump slash air conditioner actually, so it's the same thing. You know, in the summer it's the air conditioner, and in the winter it's the heat pump. The purpose of that is so that these rather large loads are usually off the, you know, running from grid power, and they're not going through the inverter, which has an eight, again an 8,000 watt limit. If the grid is down, I can go and switch that to the inverter. So I do have that capability to make the make both of these panels go through the inverter. But when we do that, obviously we have to be cognizant of the loads that we're running. Um, you know, most of the house loads are going to be fine. They're, you know, the total house loads, excluding these these other panels, are going to be well under 8,000 watts. So that's not an issue. But when you add in these loads, then we can start cramping up on that 8,000 watts and beyond. So we have to be real you know, careful, obviously, be aware of what we're running at the same time. So we're not going to be able to turn on the heat pump and the oven and uh, the rest of the computers, the loads in the house at the same time. Um, so, you know, the purpose of that switch, again, is so that under normal circumstances, we don't have to worry about what we're running. We can just go on with our merry lives and, and not have to worry about it. And then when the grid goes down, we can flip that back um, to the flip both of these to the inverter, and then we just have to think a little bit about the loads that we're running at the same time. I'm also adding an 11,000 watt uh, generator, a Generac generator, LP based generator, and the reason for that, um, you know, the generator's purpose, sole purpose in life, really, is to uh, charge these batteries. So the only time you need that generator to run is when um, you've had multiple days, overcast days, when this solar system Again, I mentioned this solar array is 7.65 kilowatts, so it's a pretty good sized array. And uh, generally, um, you know, on a, on a, uh, a fairly normal sunny day, uh, we're going to be able to pretty much generate most of the power, if not all the power, that we use as a household um, by the solar panel. The only time we're going to need more is when the, that system's not generating it, it, or you know, if it's really hot or really cold, and we need a lot more power um, to to heat or cool. 
So in that circumstance, the inverter system actually controls the generator. It's an auto start generac generator. So the inverter will watch the voltage on the battery bank. And if we're off grid and it's using power out and, it, and the battery bank hits a certain minimum voltage, then it's going to go, oh, I need more power. And it's going to say, generator, kick on. Boom, it's going to fire up the generator and it's going to let that generator run at 100% capacity. The reason it's at 100% capacity is because it has to, the generator has to carry the loads of the home at the time, which hopefully won't, won't be too bad. It'll be somewhere between probably uh, 2,000 and, and no more than probably 8,000 watts. Uh, and then it also, the excess power beyond that, um, what the house is currently pulling, it's going to put back into the battery bank. So it's going to use these charge controllers and charge back up that battery bank as quickly as it, as it can. So, you know, even in a situation where, you know, it's cloudy or overcast for several days, uh, hopefully that generator is only going to need to run maybe an hour or so a day, even in that situation, just enough to keep those batteries charged up. So that's an extra uh, insurance, if you will. Now that's an LP or natural gas generator. Obviously we don't have natural gas. I mentioned we're total electric. Even if we did, I wouldn't want to run it on natural gas because that defeats the whole purpose of being off-grid. If you're depending on natural gas for a backup generator, well that's kind of goofy because you know the, the natural gas is part of the grid. You know, the, the pumps and the pressurization of the system. So, you know, if you have something like an earthquake, you're not going to be able to depend on natural gas. I've always thought it kind of goofy for people to have natural gas backup generators. Um, you know, unless you're just using it for storms or something like that, then okay. But if you have anything that's going to interrupt that natural gas supply, uh, you, you shouldn't be using natural gas. So, in this case, it's, it's liquid propane, which is a tank that uh, we'll have installed, you know, here outside the home. Uh, this is a fairly small one. It's a 120-gallon tank. So, it ought to be enough, roughly, to support us for a month or so uh, off-grid, if need be. You know, uh, probably beyond that as long as we've got decent solar power coming in. Uh, so again, because that's just to augment, to keep that battery bank charged, if the solar can't do it for some reason. So, um, another big benefit of going with a system like that is that um, I can actually convert that. I plan to, at some point in the future, uh, add a wood gas system. We, in our case, have 14 acres of woods. We live in, in the woods, uh, except for around the house, which fortunately I have enough opening for the solar. Uh, kind of a prerequisite there. But uh, we have plenty of wood that we can chip and burn in a, in a wood gasifier, and then we can send that, that wood gas, uh, which is essentially hydrogen and methane, to um, this generator, which I can run it on wood. Um, and then, you know, problem solved if we ever can't, you know, get the liquid propane, and that's an issue. So that's kind of the system in a nutshell. Um, I think I've covered most everything there. I'll go briefly over the system ROI, or the return on investment. So... The way I've broken this down in my calculations is this is roughly a $30,000 system. Um, by the time everything's uh, you know, said and done, uh, the nice thing is um, the, the uh, federal government right now is getting a 30% tax credit on these systems, on a solar system. So that includes installation, uh, so it includes labor and the equipment for the system. So that's, that's actually a little less than that, but for the purposes of this I put a $10,000 tax credit. Um, so uh, $30,000 cost minus a $10,000 tax credit plus a $5,000 estimated maintenance. I'm going to talk briefly about that. I'm, that's roughly the cost of the battery bank. So what I figured in, uh, this is, a, again, expenses over a 30-year time frame. So I'm figuring on replacing that battery bank probably once over the 30 years, and that's what that $5,000 is. That said, I've added a battery desulfator to the system, which I've read, um, and the reviews seem to support from everyone who's used them that it can double or even triple the life of the battery system uh, by uh, keeping the plates inside the battery uh, free of the crystals that form. And that's what makes a battery one of the main con contributors to making a battery system go bad. So <coughs> through that, um, the battery bank that I have is a Roll Charette AGM bank, which is a really, really good battery. It's pretty much, uh, pretty much top of the line battery uh, bank. So I'm hoping, and they generally last, uh, I've heard, tend to, well actually more like 15 to 20 years, those batteries generally last if they're properly maintained, they're not overly discharged. Um, so I'm hoping, I, you know, with the desulfator, I can probably get 30 years out of the battery system. So that's a big, big leap forward from the technology, even just a few years back, um, you know, you, you couldn't expect that kind of life out of a battery system. But today, it, it looks like it's, it's doable. So I may not even need that $5,000 expense there for the batteries over a 30-year time frame. And then in our case, um, we're 
we're doing a, a second mortgage to finance this because the, the return on investment is there, so it makes a lot of sense. In our case, it's a 5.99% uh, interest rate. Um, so I'm figuring a roughly a, an interest uh, expense of $10,000 for the loan. So anyway, that puts the net expense uh, for the system at roughly $30, $35,000. So then we'll go to the savings over 30 years over here on the right-hand side. So we've got an estimated production of 9,830 kilowatt hours per year. That's based on four hours a day. Now our area actually averages 4.5 hours a day uh, of, of sunlight. Uh, that, again, that's the average, so that's winter and summer, um, you know, and uh, overcast, taking everything into consideration. <coughs> so since we're in the woods, we've got a little more shading on the edges of the, the early morning and late afternoon. Um, so I'm just to play it safe, I've reduced that 4.5 to 4 hours in these calculations. Um, and I'm also basing this on a 22.6 cent per kilowatt hour 30 year average uh, rate uh, utility cost. So as I mentioned earlier, we're currently paying 14.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Well traditionally, if you look at the historic prices of, of the utility power of electric cost, uh, that's going up about 6% um, per year on average if you look at the, the inflation rate of that uh, as the you know, utility companies request the rate increases and they're approved. So what I actually did for this calculation, again I'm being real conservative in these numbers, I uh, based it on a 3% inflation which is half of historic. So I'm figuring they're only going to raise the prices half of what they historically have done. And then I calculated that out over 30 years, took the average, so over the course of the 30 year average uh, that comes out to 22.6 cents per kilowatt hour. So um, that essentially means our savings over 30 years is $67,000 based on that rate, based on our production from the solar system um, being a grid interactive system and um, that rate uh, for utilities. That's also based on an 87% 30 year solar panel efficiency. So again, that's solar panels over time degrade, they lose their effic efficiency. And that's the average over that 30-year life cycle based on uh, the numbers of the, the Astro Energy panels that, that we're going to be installing. So that, come, that means we come out ahead $32,000 over 30 years on this system. Um, plus, as a big added benefit, at least from my perspective, we have the off-grid capability. So we can run off the grid. Um, you know, if the utility goes down, I won't really care. So that's, uh, that's the system in a nutshell. And that's the cost of the system. And... Um, the return on investment of the system that we've calculated out, and uh, we're looking forward to getting it installed and uh, saving money and having off-grid capability.